Uh, I don't know if I should do a memory test here or not, because it seems like it's been forever uh, since we were in the book of Exodus. We started through the book of Exodus, uh, we got up to chapter 17, so that's where we're going to be, if you have your Bibles, Je- uh, Exodus chapter 17, and we'll pick up where we left off in, in Exodus. We had Christmas in there, then we had New Year's, and then we were away, and uh, so it's been a little while, but just... If you guys have forgotten what's happened so far, I'll give you a quick recap. Remember we started off with uh, Israel being held captive, being slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And in there, that God rose up a man named Moses. And Moses was raised up in Pharaoh's house. Um, in here, he was cast out because he killed the Egyptian, trying to be sort of the savior for the Israelites. And in 40 years, he was in the wilderness, raising sheep. And the guy called him from the burning bush and said, Come, you are the one. And Moses did what a lot of us do. Who, me? You know, you must be calling, well, calling someone else. And the guy said, No, I want you, but I'll be with you. And then here he sent him down to Egypt, and Pharaoh said, No, you can't let my feet, you know, let the Israelites go. And then we had the plagues played out. And each one got worse and worse. Until finally Pharaoh's like, all right, enough, get out of here. We talk about how they traveled out. Got a couple days out, and then Pharaoh changed his mind and chased them. They came to the Red Sea. Red Sea parted. Israel got across. Egypt got halfway. And then God closed up the sea behind them. And they wandered in the wilderness for a few days and were hungry and thirsty and complained against God. First they came to a place where there was water, but the water was bitter. And they're like, oh, Moses, why did you do this to us? And God cleared the water. And they were, we're hungry. We were just on vacation, we were traveling. And uh, that's what we heard from the back seat. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, are we there yet? Right? I, saw, you know, I just had one kid in back. I can't imagine having a, you know, a million Israelites. Are we there yet? I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. Right? And, uh, and so they're traveled out. And this brings us to chapter 17. And God is working on Israel. That here they've been in the world now. The generation that has been raised was raised up in Egypt. You know, so they, they didn't know firsthand the, the experience they had with God for themselves. That in here, that, that, you know, they heard the stories, they, they had the scripture, right? They, they knew all these things were being passed on, but they didn't have any personal experience for themselves until now. And it's interesting because, I'm kind of curious, how many of you guys have, had grown up in church? How many of you guys grew up in church? Alright, so I'm guessing the rest of you didn't, or you're just not participating, that's fine. Right? Uh, I grew up in church. And I have my brothers and sisters who grew up in church. And, and you know, somewhere along the line, you have to make that transition from, uh, you know what, I go to church because my mom and dad make me go to church. To a point where, you know what, I go because I want to go. I, I go because I believe this. And I think every parent that is a challenge for us to really bestir within our children that, look, this is now your faith. What do you believe? Because if it's just because mom and dad, you know what? When mom and dad aren't around, they're not going to go. And in here, they make this for themselves. Now, for those of you who didn't grow in church, you're here because you want to be here. Right? Somewhere along the line, you know, if you didn't have any heritage of going to church, somewhere along the line, you felt like, you know what? I'm going to have something missing in my life. Right? And somewhere along the line, you realize there has to be more. And so I'm going to check out this God thing. You know, I, I, I've exhausted myself. I've come to the end of myself. I need something bigger than me. And... So in this, I'm going to be drawn to God. And I'm going to see what God does in my life. But no matter how we got here, you're here. And because of that, you know, we got to find out whether or not this this God 
thing, this, this faith thing is real. And that all plays out by really sort of a testing of our faith. You know, God brought Israel across the Red Sea. They saw this mighty miracle, right? They were in Egypt. They had the plague. They saw the mighty hand of God. And yet when the, things got a little bit hard, they were now kind of whining, you know. You know I mean, they are sort of, you know, this idea of sort of, we talk about sort of snowflakes. It's nothing new. You go back in Egypt, right? They, they get out there. God did all these wonderful things for them. And then when things get a little bit hard, they're like, oh, man, why we do this? We were better off. Why, you know? And really what happens is our faith becomes tested to really show us where we are. Right? The purpose of a test, you know, oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, I'm in a period of testing and God's, God's teaching me something. I'm going to be sort of nitpicky because the purpose of a test is not to teach you something. It's to reveal what you already know. Right? I mean, some of you have been out of school for a little while. But, I was going to ask you to kind of roll things back in your mind a little bit. But, you know, the last time you took a test, how many of you were like, yay, I'm so excited for the test? You know, we used to have a teacher that would always pop, bring these pop quizzes. And we'd whine and complain. Right? They're like, you didn't tell us we're having a test. And she'd be like, yeah, that's why it's called a pop test. Right? Pop quiz. Right? You're not supposed to know. You should be studying all along. Right? Because I'm, I'm, I was a crammer. Right? I was one of these guys that, like, you know, riding the school bus, studying, or in the class before, studying for the test I knew I had next. Right? I wouldn't study for a week. I wouldn't have all the things prepped. I wanted to cram to the last minute. We're in Bible school. The teacher would ask, you know, does anyone want to pray? We wanted to pray. Because we say, Lord, give us divine revelation in this test. Right? It would show us things we never knew that we do well in the test. And the teacher would be like, you know, you know, Lord, just bring to mind those things that these students studied. No, I, I, want, I don't want the things I didn't study to come to mind. Right? Because I wanted to do well on that. In our world, you know, we want to do fairness because sometimes we, we score tests on a curve. Well, it really just means that you just got to be better than someone else. Right? And every class has that one kid that does really well, that throws off the whole curve, and everyone's mad because they studied and I didn't, and somehow it's their fault I didn't do well. Well, God talks about testing our faith. And what that really does is reveal where we truly are. It's easy to say, God, I love you. But when things get hard, do I really love him? Say, Lord, I trust you. But when the difficulty comes, do I really trust him? And so the things that we go through in our lives really reveal in us really where we are spiritually. But not to that, just that end result to say, God, you know, I, I failed this test or I didn't do well in this. But in here is to bring us back to say, okay, Lord, you know what? Work in me to make in me what you need me to be. And that takes a lifetime. You know, God's been working on me my whole life. And so we come down to, and chapter 17 starts off with this idea of, of testing and, and, and quarreling. How do we handle the test? Israel didn't do too well. And we can do better. Faith will always be tested. Untested faith is untrusted faith. But in our lives, it's so easy to say, God, I trust you until I have to. Right? Right? You need to say, Lord, I love you until that love is put to the test. Right? I mean, it works in our earthly relationships. You know, you got couples that get newly married and, oh, I just love you and you just love me. And, you know, and you don't, you don't need anything. I was studying and share and they have a song, like, I got you, babe. Right? They say our love won't pay the rent. Right? We don't need anything. It's like, I remember, you know, newly married, you know, for a month. We didn't need anything. We just, you know, we're just happily, blissfully in love. 
And then we got our first fight. I won't tell you what it was about, but my wife's out there like, I will tell you I was wrong. Is that fair? Right. I was wrong. What? <laughs> uh, but in the situation, right? All of a sudden, I, we got this big fight. And it was like, oh man, this is over. You know, we had a good couple of weeks, but now the marriage is done because we fought. Now, i got to be careful because in Bible school, we had one of our professors said, the pastor should never tell his congregation that him and his wife fight. I said, what were we supposed to say? He goes, well, he had a discussion. So we were discussing things. And I was like, this is it. Mar- you know, our marriage is over. You know, because you know, if we really loved each other, we would never have ever quarrel, would never fight, right? And it's like, oh, no, it's all over. Well, you know what? We worked through it. Like, oh, wow. Our love is strong enough to go through a fight. Our love is strong enough to put up with that I'm an idiot and a jerk sometimes. Our love is greater than that. And over the years, it's been through good and through bad, the struggles and all that. And what that does is reveal not just a superficial pitter-patter of the heart love, but a deep love, a commitment of love. Through better or for worse. Did you really mean that when you said that? Same thing with God. As we turn to Him and say, God, I love you. That Lord, I want to follow you. God, I want you to have your way in my life. Well, it's easy to believe that. It's easy to say that until it really comes down to the wire. And the testing of our faith is, is to work us through this. Because our faith in God, true, genuine faith, the Bible says is more precious than gold. Peter says it this way. It says, In this you greatly rejoice, Though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because what a wonderful thing it is, is us as Christians... To be able to stand before the Lord someday and He says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. At the end of the day, you know what? When things were tough, you kept going. That when the world said, Why are you doing this? You're like, Because I love the Lord beyond all things. I want to live for Him no matter what. And no matter what price I need to pay, I will continue to follow Him. And Jesus says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. I mean, I, probably one of the toughest jobs, well, I don't know if this is fair or not, I'll say one of the toughest jobs was I worked at McDonald's and I worked in their high school and, and you talk about the kids that do that, it's, it was, you know, we're back flipping burgers, it's hot, it, they work you hard, don't pay you much, it was a tough job. And every summer we would get a school teacher who would, you know, because they have the summers off, so they would look for a job to fill in. And so we get some of these teachers who would come, and they would be working. And it's funny because, you, know, you know, I remember one kid is like, hey, you know, you were my teacher in school, and now I'm training you how to, how to flip a burger, which is really sort of revenge at some, at some level. And I'll tell you, nine out of ten times, the teachers, and they said, this, this, ain't, this is for the birds. I quit. This is too hard. You know, kudos to you guys that continue on in this, right? God calls us to press on, to be faithful when it's hard. And that genuine faith, that real faith, Lord, I don't want to be a real Christian. I don't want to be a phony baloney Christian. I don't want to be a Christian just when it's easy. I don't want to be a Christian just when it works out to my advantage. Right? I mean, you talk to someone and say, well, why do you follow Jesus? Because I love him. And I, we had a situation where things were, weren't working well for me. And I had this guy I was witnessing to, and he's like, well, wait a minute. He goes, if you love God, how come, how come this bad stuff's happening to you? Right? I thought loving God made it so bad things never happened to you. That's not true. 
I said, no. I, what I do know is that in the hard times, God's with me. And that changes everything. Being a Christian doesn't mean you're exempt from problems. What it just means that we have a God who's in it with us. And we know that's not the end of the story. We know how things end. That, look, the Bible says, I've gone to prepare a place for you. Right? I know there's going to be a day with no more pain and no more sorrow. I know there's going to be a day where I'll be reunited with loved ones who have gone on before. I know I'm going to see my Savior face to face someday. I, I know all of these things. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen five minutes from now. But Lord, help me be faithful. And sometimes the tough things we go through is that proving in here. Now we got to get into Exodus. I haven't preached for two weeks. I'm, I'm, so you get, I'm getting twitchy. All right. Exodus chapter 17. This is what happened to Israel. It says, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rehoboam. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses, saying, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock to thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do to this people? For they are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. And also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the contentions of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Massa means to test. Meribah means to quarrel or complain. That God had brought them out. Think about this. He delivered them with a mighty hand out of Egypt using the plagues. They saw miracle after miracle after miracle. God split the Red Sea. They saw that and God provided for them and led them out. God had already turned bitter water sweet so they could already drink. They complained about being hungry. God gave them manna. And so in this, God has provided for them and God has taken care of them all this way. And so now they come to a situation where there's no water around at all. And they're ready to give up. And they're ready to give up. And God says, look, I've tested your faith and you have failed. They failed. Because they didn't trust. See, as I get older, as you get older, we have the opportunity of seeing how God has been faithful. God has been faithful over the years. God has taken care of us over and over and over again. And so when I come to this point in my life, why do I doubt? God's been faithful all the way. Why do I doubt now? Oh, because my faith wasn't what I thought it'd be. And in here, they always turn. We see this in Israel. We're going to see this as we continue on through Exodus. Time and time again, they're like, oh man, I want to go back. I want to go back to Egypt. Things were so much better there. Let me tell you something. If God has delivered you, God has freed you from something, you're not better off with it. You know, maybe there's relationships in your past that God has turned the page on. And God says, press on. You need those things. Maybe there's some friendships that you need to leave behind. Maybe there's some addictions. Maybe there's some other things in your life that's been holding you back. And God has come in and given you a new opportunity, a new chance. You are not better off going back. Keep going forward. The past, the test. First of all, I want to tell you, God tests our faith. He tests us. He will bring us to a position where we say, okay, you know what, God? I'll say, God, I love you. And he says, do you really? Oh, yeah, I love you. Then all of a sudden, something happens like, God, you don't love me anymore. Right? And sometimes, I, you know, it's amazing that all of a sudden I can become this little kid. 
Right? Because you ever corrected a little kid? Right? You know, we're at the Good News Club, and there's a little boy that was doing some things he wasn't supposed to do. And I'm like, all right, get over here. I don't want to. Well, yeah, come over here. Do it. Come on. No. And he goes, I don't like you anymore. I'm like, fine. Get over here. <laughs> right? It doesn't change anything. And then fast forward a little bit, and we're having a great time again. Right? He, he sees, I love him, whether he's obedient or not. I don't like what he's doing. But you know, I, I'm not going to change how I feel about him. And it's an amazing thing. Because when kids know that, you know what? Don't do that. Well, you don't like me. Yeah, I still like you, but go over and do it. Oh. And we see this faithfulness that's carried out. I you know, I think one of the tragedies we have in our society, especially as men, you know, that we have so many men who aren't in the home, that aren't involved in their kids' life, and it breaks my heart because these kids learn that you know what, especially dads aren't dependable. They're in and out of my life, and we turn around and replace God and say, "Well, God, you're my heavenly Father. God's going to come and go. God's not going to go anywhere." But that testing takes place. Psalms tells us, it says, You called in the time of trouble and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. You tested me at the waters of Mirabah. Right? Coral, here they are, Israel was whining and complaining, and God said, You know what? I tested you to see if you would trust me. Or would you turn your heart back? Folks, when we are in the desert place, if you will, if we're in a place where we don't see that supply, keep pressing forward, keep trusting. In God. God has not brought you this far to leave you high and dry now. Right? Take a look at your life. We, we, you know, count your blessings. I love the you know, old hymn. Count your blessings, name it one by one. It's a great exercise because I can stop and I can reflect on time and time again in my life. We could probably spend the rest of the afternoon sitting together and say, you know what? What's an answer to prayer that God has done? We could probably. In your life, God has answered a prayer. God has been there. Right? God didn't do all of that to leave you now. God didn't bring Israel all of that, freed them, brought them through the Red Sea, provided for them a feeding of manna to bring them to a point that He's going to leave them high and dry now. They don't know where it's coming from, but that's okay. Trust in the Lord. That knowing that testing your faith produces patience. Oh, patience. I wish God would hurry up and give me patience. So, but let your patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Right? I don't know what you're going through in your life right now. But I can tell you that God is with you. I can tell you that God has not abandoned you. Do I know how it's going to work out? No. But God will. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Put your relationship with God first, but they make the the main focus. And God will start putting the other things in your life in its place. And if any of you lack wisdom, the end there says, Let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally, without reproach, and it will be given to him. Right? God, I don't know what I'm doing. Boy, that's a prayer I say often. I don't know what I'm doing, God. Give me wisdom. What's the right choice? And we have a promise. We talk about the promises of God. Here is one. If you ask God for wisdom, He will give it to you when you need it. Testing shows what we know and where we're really at. You know, when the difficult time comes in my life, and if I fold like a lawn chair, my faith wasn't that strong. And that's okay, because in here, if I acknowledge that, I say, you know what, God? I need to trust you more. Right? Now, I don't know if you ever did well on a test. I don't know if you really did bad on a test. I can say, uh, most of the time I've taken a test, I think back in school, and Bible school, and college, and all that. Sit down, and I'm going to take this test. And I, I was pretty confident in most of the tests I took. I always wasn't confident walking out of the room when I was done. 
And in one test, I remember, I, I got an F. And that was the first F I ever got. And I was like, <laughs> it's all over. But no, but what that showed me was, you know what? There's some areas I need to work on. There's some things I thought I knew, I didn't. So in here, it becomes a learning opportunity for me. And so in our lives, when we struggle, when we, we feel like we failed that test, it's okay. As long as we learn from it and say, okay, lad, you know what? I need some things to work on. What we don't do is we don't test God. God tests our faith, but we don't test God. God, prove yourself to me. God has nothing to prove to us. And actually, time and time again, we see it in the scriptures. The warning against that. Deuteronomy goes later on top of Israel. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. Goes back to the, what we talk about in Exodus. Right? They were out there saying, God, where are you? God, you don't care for us. God, we're going to go back. God's like, yeah, I see where your heart's really at. The danger comes in of saying, we're going to put God on trial. You know what? The Pharisees tried that. The scribes and Pharisees were talking to Jesus, and they answered, said, Teacher, we want you to see a sign from you. Right? Jesus had already been doing miracles. He has been teaching. He's been doing all these things. And they said, well, well, just prove yourself one more time. If you just prove yourself, God, then I'll do this. And Jesus answered and says, But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign will be given to them except for the sign of Jonah. That in here we turn around and we see and reflect upon the fact that God, we love you, we serve you because of who you are, not because of what you've done for us. You know, if we only love him for all the stuff he gives us, that's a very shallow relationship. Right? My God gives me stuff, so I love him. Well, what if he doesn't? Right? Well, God, I won't love you anymore. Right? Where's your faith? Real quick. Our testing of our faith. How about test of patience? As I already said, you know, patience is one of those things that takes a long time to get. It's kind of in the definition. Having patience. Because it's like, okay, Lord, here's my prayer. Now answer it right now. That doesn't always work that way. Israel was brought out and if they would have just waited on God, God would have provided. God has already provided for them already, right? But what happened was they jumped the gun. They got ahead of God. That's a dangerous thing when we get ahead of God. Isaiah encourages us with this, but those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. In a walk we have with the Lord by trusting in Him, by waiting on Him. And we talk about this a little bit in Sunday school. That waiting doesn't just mean, okay, I'm going to sit around and twiddle my thumbs. No. If I am faithful, God, you know what? I'm just going to do what you want me to do. Right? I don't know the situation. I don't know the answer. I don't know how to be delivered. I don't know all these pieces. But Lord, I'm going to be faithful in what I do know. No, I'm going to keep praying, God. I'm, I'm going to keep coming to church. I'm going to uh, keep uh, reading my Bible. I'm going to keep doing these things. I don't know how this is all going to come together, but I'm going to be faithful in doing what I know. And in here, what happens is God gives us an energy to continue on the walk that we need to do. It's an amazing thing. Because if I don't do that, if I don't focus on Him, and I don't do something, right? Then I get stuck in my own head. I start getting depressed. I start having all these fears and have all these doubts, right? All these other things are distracting me. And I don't go anywhere. But boys, you know what? I turn around and say, oh, it's Sunday morning. You know what? I'm going to go to church. I'm going to go. I don't feel like it today, but I'm going to go anyways. It's amazing what happens all of a sudden now when I put my life in motion, when I'm doing things proactively to serve Him, of having Him be directing to my life, things are falling into place. Instead of just sitting back. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding, but all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Say, Lord, I, you know what? I don't know what's around the path, but this is your path. I'm going to stay on the path. You know, think of Dorothy. You know, follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow, follow, follow. Right? Uh, right? But the whole idea was, Dorothy, just follow the path. And of course, what happened? Here we go. Preaching according to Wizard of Oz. I don't know if that's heresy or not. But, right, but follow the road. Dorothy always got herself in trouble when she got off the path. Right? Get out of the path. Stay on the path. You'll be all right. And sometimes I feel like that, you know, as a, as a pastor, you know, time and time again, I get sort of the same comments. You know, how are you doing in your life? Well, I'm doing it. Are you on the path? Well, no, I've gotten all the way. Get on the path! Woo! Sorry, right? I mean, but it's, you say, well, pastor, it can't be that simple. It is! Right? Stay on the path. Follow it. Don't be distracted, right? Sometimes there's some pretty things. Oh, look at this. Oh, okay. Right? Or maybe there's some scary things. Well, it looks dark around the corner, so I'm going to take a shortcut. No! Stay on the path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but all your way acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Like I said, I haven't preached for two weeks, so it's all coming out now. Last thing. Testing of our assurance. Truly the presence of God. Truly experience the presence of God in our life. Is God really with us? Because what happens when the, you know, it gets cloudy and dark in my life, the storms come in in my life, and I wonder, God, are you really there? And the answer is, yes, He is. God was with Israel. He had brought them to that place. He led them there. He was there with them. The problem is they didn't recognize it or see it. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such thing as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or what? Forsake you. What shall separate me from the love of Christ? And the answer is nothing. Right? God will not leave you. He's a never present help in a time of trouble. We just don't call out to him. We don't reach out to Him. Right? If we do that, then we fail the test. If and when these dark times come, when we struggle, if we call out to Him, He will always be there. I don't know what's going on in your life, but I will tell you, God is there. Because He promised, and God cannot break His promise. The psalmist says it this way, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though in the waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, in all these things I will not be afraid, because God is with me. God, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I know you're there, and I know you're bigger than it. So I'm going to stick by you. Years ago, my oldest, we were at uh, camp, and I was a camp director. And so I was large and in charge, and my daughter was probably, I don't know, about seven years old at the time. And it was funny because I caught her talking to one of the older girls. And she goes, well, you have to do, you ever see a little seven-year-old girl do that? You have to do what I told you to do. And the, you know, the counselor was like... What? My dad's the director. Right? Boy, she was bold. Why? Not because of the authority she had, but because of who her dad is. Right? Now, I had a conversation with my daughter. We had to set some things straight. But part of that is true in our lives. 
Why are we fearful? Why do we doubt? We are children of the King. The Creator of the universe has called me His child. I can call out Daddy. Why should I be fearful? Right? And I understand it. You know, the picture here is the earth shaken, and you know, maybe your whole world is turning upside down. Maybe everything is falling apart. Pastor, how can you tell me? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God will God. He's got you. Put him first, and all these things will fall into place. Remember this. Psalms 121, verse 1. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. Right? Maybe you're one of these ones that when the trouble comes, that you, you know, finagle things, and I, you know, I got certain people I can talk to, I got a plan, I got a scheme, all these things, and I try to work all these things out. The Bible makes it real easy. You know, the first thing we should do is look up. You know, you make that a habit of your life. First thing is turn to God. First thing is seek Him out for wisdom, right? We already said He'll give it to you. Right? Anytime we doubt, anytime we fear, look up. And God will take care. Trust involves letting go. And knowing God is there to catch you. Of letting go. Maybe there's some things in your life you need to let go of. Maybe it's some fears and doubts. Maybe it's some habits and relationships. I don't know what is going on in your life. But maybe there's some things you need to let go of and trust God. And He will catch you. Israel brought him out and Moses hit that rock with his rod and water came out. God took care of him. They never had to fear or doubt. They just needed to wait and trust and have patience. Because God was there. Folks, that all carries out true in your life. God's here. Just wait on Him. Be faithful. And God will take care and provide. But God, You will catch me. My oldest daughter was one that... We started this back when she was little. Be careful what you start with your kids when they're little. Because they... Uh, she was this little, little, and I, I, big thing is, hey, she'd be on the stairs, she'd be like four or five up. I say jump, and at first she's like no 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 no. I thought, oh, God, no, no. So she jumped, and I'd catch her. And she's like me. Well, then she got pretty brave. And then she was up like five or six steps, right? And she's like, you know, well that evolved over the years. You know, it was one thing when she was like three or four years old. Dad, catch me! I was like, All right. well, then she started getting like nine and ten, and she's getting a little bigger, a little heavier. Yeah, but I want her to know that, you know what, I will be here. I'll, I'll be here to catch you. Well, then it became a game of all of a sudden spontaneously I hear, catch me, Dad, and she'd jump off things. You know, it was just like, almost like living with a cat. You ever had a cat that randomly will attack you? That's, that's what this was like. You know, so it's be like we'd be out in public and all of a sudden it's like, hey, Dad, catch me. <laughs> you know? Oh. And praise God, I never dropped her. But she had total trust that no matter what, Dad's going to catch me. Now the problem with the picture is, I'm a wimp, right? I'm not. Oh, I was going to say I'm not in good shape, but round is a shape. So yeah, I'm in good shape. I'm just an oval, right? Yeah. You know? But God will never fail. And when God tells us to jump, He will always catch us. When I trust in Him, He will always see us through. If we trust in Him. Israel came out to the desert place and they failed the test. Folks, in our lives, we don't have to fail. If we do, the Bible says that we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says, let's try this again. And sometimes what I find in my life, is sometimes I'm in the same test over and over and over again, because I haven't learned. 
Right? And maybe you're in that place where maybe you, you feel like you're in the same trap over and over again. And maybe you haven't learned the lesson that you're supposed to learn yet. You know, well, Pastor, what's the way out? Is to pass the test. And then there'll be a new test. But God is faithful. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, in the desert places of our lives, Lord, you are there. Lord, you will take care. You will provide as I seek you. Lord, Israel failed miserably. Lord, when they were tested, they doubted your presence, Lord. They did not have patience. And Lord, they doubted you. But Lord, I, these things are here for our example, Lord. Change us. Lord, help me to trust. Help me to obey. Make a difference in my life, Lord. We ask this in your name.